How do we know 12 is not an option? Well, uh, there's a paper of people who did some fairly sophisticated trimming. He didn't look at all possible colorings and just look at each one. But for example, if you color the first six edges red that forms one of these bad things, well, already stop that branch. There's no use to look at any of the others because that one's dead. And so by carefully trimming, I presume you can actually show that 12 is not enough. Uh, for those of you who are com computer enthusiasts, check out the Wikipedia page. Pretty good page, actually, on this. Uh, so why is 13 considered a candidate? Because they haven't well, been could, Yeah, because they couldn't, because <laughs> because that same method didn't work for 13, so the, it's looking. Although I have to say that one of the people who did the most computing on this was convinced that probably 11 was the answer, but it was wrong. They actually found a way to go a few more. So, uh, you know. So it's somewhere between 13 and this Graham's number. Well, uh, yes. Yes, yeah, 13 it might be happen, it might be 14 or 15, but uh, guessing like, looks like it's 13. And uh, certainly I'm sure it's closer to 13 than this other slightly bigger number. In fact, uh, there's a recent paper posted in the archive that shows that now the upper bound comes down below this Graham's number. It's still a gigantically big number, but you know, in the, the world of big numbers, uh, I mean, numbers get so large, if you double it, it doesn't change. So that's, that's a pretty big number. Well, it's not quite like that, but it's big, yeah. Why were you even cooking up this problem? This, this, like, this seems like a weird game you came up with, with the cubes and the red and the blue. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, this this uh, grew out of a very general combinatorial theorem that implies Ramsey's theorem and Hales Jewett and all kinds of theorems. And one of the applications where you interpret the variables in a certain way turned out to be looking at various configurations formed by vertices of a subcube. And it just was very natural when you have the vertices as zero and one entuples, and you look at pairs of these things and you try to color them and look for some nice structure. It just fit naturally into the parameters of this theorem, so we said, okay, let's see what it, let's interpret it in terms of coloring the edges uh, formed by the vertices of an n cube, and see what see what comes out. So you weren't like you weren't like making up a game like you, you no. weren't playing. This was hardcore no. math. Yeah, it in some sense it it captures the gap between what seems to be really true and what you can prove, and often the gaps are tremendous. You can prove something must happen by some time, but really it probably happens much sooner. It's just that you can't get your hands on that much sooner. So at least you know that it happens sometime. That's something. And now the idea is to try to, I mean, there's a nice example of that that happened oh, within the past year on the twin prime conjecture. This was an old problem that goes back to the time of the Greeks, as far as people know, that you look at a prime number, that is a number that has no factors except one in itself, such as 13 or 29, uh, and you'll notice that pretty often you'll find pairs of prime numbers that differ by two, like 11 and 13, or 101, 103, for example. And the conjecture was that this happens infinitely often. You'll find pairs of primes that differ by two as large as you like, and that seemed to be completely unattackable until this recent breakthrough by a, a Chinese mathematician living in New Hampshire named Zhang Yitang who showed that, well, maybe two, we don't know about two, but definitely, infinitely often, you'll get two primes that differ by at most 70 million. We say, well, wait a minute, that's, that's pretty far from two. Well, not really. It's a, at least it's a bound, the first actual bound. And now people, once they understand his ideas, his techniques, have been able to chip that down, and now it's down to 270. So uh, they think that that has about run out of steam, they're gonna need new ideas, but it just it kind of reaffirms your belief, not that anybody doubted anyway, that these pairs of twin primes do exist forever. So chipping, making, at least there's some bound, 70 million, and once you get that, now you take one more step up the mountain and eventually you hope to get to two. You know, a lot of harmless looking questions about the digits of numbers that uh, don't have so much 
deep number theory uh, information, uh, but there are questions people can ask. It's, you know, for example, nobody knows that if you look at the decimal expansion of pi, that eventually the digit 9 doesn't appear anymore, right? It could happen that pi goes out and then uh, 3.415962, and then at the trillionth digit, all of a sudden, you don't see 9 ever again. Well, come on. That's not possible, right? No, but nobody can prove it couldn't happen. Well, it might happen. I don't know. But what you think for pi is that each digit occurs about a tenth of the time. Ten digits? Why should 9 be any different from 8? 6? Well, yeah, can't prove it. If a mathematician is trying to bound his results or bound something like you were, and the, and the number is so high, it's this you know, famously high number, have you done a good job bounding your results? Well, the first step is to get some bound, like this erdős sekeres. Well, there's some bound, it was about 4 to the n. And now, what's the truth? What's the correct bound? And like the twin prime. Well, okay, you got 70 million. Well, okay, can you work it down? And they did work it down to 30 million and 5,000, now 270. So often the first step is to get some bound and then try to improve it. And uh, sometimes the first bound is not so hard and proving the right answer is really hard. Sometimes getting that first bound is actually kind of hard. That 70 million was really took some new ideas. Was and, your bound hard? Was Graham's number hard to come uh, up with or was it, was well, it just an old easy progression? Uh, it, it, uh, it took kind of a complicated proof that's reflected in the size of the number. When you get a proof that's uh, very recursive and each function depends on earlier functions in a complicated way, they tend to build up pretty fast. And if the argument is complicated, then the bounds tend to be kind of complicated. And sometimes uh, they're just so complicated that nobody even wants to write it down, which is, well, it's, uh, it, there is a bound, but we don't quite know what it is, you see. And, uh, so uh, when this upper bound fell out of your work on, in this area, did you think, "Wow, this number's big"? Like, did you think this is stupidly big, or was this a normal number for you in that, at that time? Uh, in this branch of mathematics, you get fairly large numbers, and often you don't worry about the size because you feel that the truth is so much smaller that at least to show that there is a bound. Okay, it comes from the proof, and uh, very recently, in the past couple of years, people again have looked at variations of this argument, especially one due to a, a very prolific Israeli mathematician, Shela, And they showed that actually there is a bound of this arrow type that's 2, 3, arrow 16. That seems to be a better, a more, it's still a gigantic number. It's just a lot smaller than this. And just by refining the argument, so that's kind of the next step. Here's the first argument. And the first argument wasn't really designed for this problem. It just kind of fell out. If you really now look at the argument and apply it just to this particular problem, you can then make shortcuts and try to squeeze it down, still miles away from the truth, but at least getting closer. And that's called progress. So that, so, and that's for this problem. The upper yeah. bound for this problem has yeah. been brought down. Yeah. Why did this number become, it became a bit of a celebrity number for a while, didn't it? What happened? Well, I think uh, what happened, one of the most influential kind of writers on recreational mathematics was a fellow named Martin Gardner, who will have his centennial coming up pretty soon. And uh, he wrote it in one of his columns. And a lot of people read the columns, and it just kind of caught on, and people looked at it, and it has kind of a, a pleasing presentation, three, a lot of arrows, and what's going on, it looks like kind of a pyramid, and the, you know, can you explain it? And, and people uh, uh, worked it into a uh, beer drinking song, rather than you know, a thousand bottles of beer on the wall and now the Graham's number. In fact, I just got email last month from a music composer who composed a song based on this number. I, I couldn't quite see the connection, but I, I told her, yeah, it looks interesting, you see. Some independent music guy said, oh, I was inspired by this. So. Uh, uh, was Martin Gardner interested in the cube problem, or did he did he recognize the novelty value of the size of the number? Uh, well, he wasn't a mathematician, which he felt was one of his big advantages, because if he could write something that he understood, then he felt the readers probably could understand it as well. But uh, I think he could certainly 
picture, and he's familiar with n-dimensional cubes and color and Ramsey theory, and, and just was kind of amused by this. Here's a simple looking problem, and there's a giant bound, and, and, the, and the truth seems to be a lot smaller, but we don't know. And he liked to put things out to kind of challenge readers, and, uh, and uh, you know. So each column uh, that he wrote, there's a file of correspondence that was generated by readers who read the column over years. All those folders are at Stanford in a library, and I've been meaning sometime to go up and see the correspondence that came about with this problem. He usually would write you if someone claimed this or that or something, or you know. And of course, if you did the same problem with three colors, it's a much larger number, which I didn't. I just want to keep it modest, just to three colors. Oh, it's probably much bigger. When I tell people uh, about Graham's number, and it had it had this label of the biggest number, and everyone always says, "Well, I've got a bigger one. What right. about Graham's number plus one?" Right. Why? What was special about Graham's number that gave it this? this well, uh, it it really came up in a proof. That is, here was a problem, kind of a natural problem, coloring the edges in a cube, and uh, or the all the line segments from vertices of a cube, and looking for some special configuration, and you'd like to say, well, it eventually is there. When? Well, this is this guarantees it. Maybe something a lot less does, and uh, so, but you could. You know, change this problem and say, you know, I have a hundred colors, or I don't just want four vertices; I want eight vertices that form something. Well, those numbers get much larger. This was the first interesting case that already gave a pretty big number. We get to a point where the number of now, hopefully, you've grasped. Just adding one arrow. Oop. How are you? Hello. Goodbye.